please be seated. Good morning. You can take your Bible this morning. We're going to go to the book of Numbers. Last year, last year, last week, we talked about um, how we want to hear God speak. And a way that God is speaking to us is through the Holy Scriptures. Amen? Amen. And uh, God is still speaking through this ancient text. Words fitly spoken for this day and this time and for each individual situation. And last week we talked about how uh, we raised our affections for the Scriptures again. And we kind of said, get behind me, Satan, whispering those things about the Bible being boring or not relevant or tired or I'm looking for something new. And we we were reminded that all Scripture is inspired, that God is behind it. It's not just an old, tired book, but that God is behind the Bible. Amen? And we talked about how the Word of the Lord endures forever. How it stands well beyond the latest fad of each generation. The Word of the Lord stands forever. And that the words of God accomplish their purpose. It says in Isaiah 55 that whenever the Word of God is spoken out, whenever the Word of God is heard, it is never in vain. Amen? But that it always accomplishes the Word that it was set out to do. And, and um, and so we've been asking this last week as we approach the scriptures again, speak to me, Lord. And I've been getting reports throughout the congregation of people reading the Bible, first of all, amen, and that God was showing them some things. Did that happen to anybody? I know some reports of that, uh, people staying up late reading Micah, reading Isaiah, and getting the verse of the day just at the right time and things like that. So praise God. And so this morning, what we're going to look at is, what do we do when, and these moments happen, what do we do when the Bible seems dry or boring? What do we do when the Bible seems boring? And you're still in numbers, right? Get, get ready. We'll get to this at the end, but I just want to show you that when you're reading the Scriptures, and we believe what we heard last week. We believe that the Bible's inspired. We believe that the Word of the Lord endures forever. We believe that there's power in God's Word. But sometimes, let's be honest, when we're reading, sometimes it's difficult, right? Amen? Anybody had ever been difficult to read the Scriptures, right? You're reading, you're trying to get understanding, and it just seems dry. Or maybe you're reading just because you know you're supposed to, and that's what Mama said, and all the rest. But it's just boring. Well, what do you do? Well, the first thing that we should do is we should... Pray. Remember we said last week that oftentimes the problem isn't with the scriptures, it's with who? It's with you and me. So we need to pray. Like, so you're reading the Bible and you put yourself just looking at the words but thinking about what you have to get at the grocery store. Has that ever happened, right? Pray and say, God, please help me right now. I want to I want to hear your words here. Pray. Fight against that. And, and beat your mind focused again. God speaks to me. So that's the first thing that we would do. And then sometimes... You know what we need to do? Sometimes we need to give ourselves a treat. Halloween's tomorrow, right? And things, when things get tricky, sometimes we need a treat, amen? And what I mean by that is if you're digging into Nahum, right? And, and if you don't even know there is a book of the Bible named Nahum, you came to the right place this morning, right? So give yourself a little treat. And what I mean by that is go read Psalm 23. Go read... Go read a proverb. Go, go to the Gospels. Read the Sermon on the Mount. Read what Jesus did for us on the cross. And get our hearts again going, oh yeah, this is good stuff here. I need to, to get a little treat and remind myself that there's life here, right? Talk to someone. Say, hey, I'm having trouble reading this. You want to get together and talk about it. Listen to a, a sermon related to that text. Read a different translation. These are all things that we can do. Pray. And then maybe you need to give yourself a little treat. And then the next thing is, when the Bible seems boring, keep reading. Wait, what? That doesn't make any sense. Well, it makes about as much sense as going to the gym one time leads to a six-pack, amen? When you go to the gym for the first time, it's horrible. You want your prayer life to increase? Go to the gym when you haven't been there in years. You will be crying, oh my God, oh my God. But it's the same thing with the Scriptures. 
You got to keep it up. You got to keep it up. Keep reading. God speaks to me. I'm just going to keep digging in here and believing that you're going to speak to me. So don't quit. That's the thing. Don't quit. Keep reading. And the last thing is, believe that the Word is working in you. But there are some times where things you're reading now are not going to affect you in some spectacular, supernatural way, maybe for a year. Maybe you're not going to connect all the dots to what you're reading for five years. Maybe it's going to be something that you read then in your quiet time that seems boring or dry, that you're going to speak an answer to somebody that week. Believe that as you're reading, that, there, that what God promised, that His Word never goes out void, is happening in you, okay? It's happening in you. And so, I want to look at the book of Numbers today, and we're going to start in chapter 22. And the reason why I want to do that is the book of Numbers, probably amongst all the books of the Bible, has a reputation of being the most boring and the most dry. Right? Second only to Leviticus. We're going to, we're going to look at Numbers a little bit this morning, because I want to show you that actually there's some great things in here, because even the book of Numbers is the Word of God. Amen? Tell your neighbor, the book of Numbers is the Word of God, too. Go ahead, tell them. Part of the problem with the book of Numbers is it's called Numbers. Right? So, like, the accountant likes it, and the math teacher likes it, but all the rest of us who probably hate math and hate numbers say, Man, isn't there a book called, like, Chipotle or something like that, or Donut, right? Well, the Hebrew name for the book of Numbers is actually Bamid Bar, which means in the wilderness. And the book of Numbers is split into three sections about the different periods when Israel was in different parts of the wilderness, when they were camping in Sinai, when they were in the wilderness of Quran, and then in the plains of Moab. And it, it, it tells us about what should have been a two-week journey out of slavery into the promised land that God had called them to. But it ends up taking them 40 years. Man, talk about traffic, talk about construction, slowing your ride down. This goes from two weeks to 40 years, and the reason why it takes 40 years is because towards the beginning of the book of Numbers, when Moses sends some spies in to take a look at what this new and awesome land is going to be like, they come back and they talk to people into saying, man, we don't want to go there. And God says, oh, you don't want to go there? Then you won't go there. And the entire generation that first got that promise to go into that promised land instead wanders around for 40 years until they all die. Crazy. So the reason the book of Numbers is journeying through, through the wilderness is because the people, when presented with the opportunity to go to the place God had called them, said no. And they, then they pulled one of those things that I pulled as I was a child. Dad says, okay, we're not going. And then what do you do? No, 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 no. That's cool. I'll go. We'll go, Dad. We'll go. And then Dad says, sorry, it's too late. That's what my dad did all the time. Ooh, I think I've learned. That's what the children of Israel did. And God said, no. And so we get towards the end of the book of Numbers, where the children of Israel are just wandering around, essentially waiting for the older generation to die. We talk about a depressing time. And they're in the wilderness. And we get to chapter 22. And before we read it, why don't we pray? Right? Because I know we'll be fighting this temptation to be like, hey, let's just get to John 3.16 something. Well, let's ask God to teach us something, all right? So let's pray together. Father, we pray that you would speak to us through your word right now. Help us to be focused and help us to remember that this is spiritual right now and that you have these words written down and preserved for generations for a reason. And you have something for us today because we're seeking you through your word. So please teach us, Lord. I pray that you would help us to fight against that temptation within us that to tune out or to be bored or to feel that it's dry. So please, Lord, revive us through this and teach us as we approach your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. So chapter 22 begins right after the children of Israel had, had two great military victories against two armies that they should have lost against. And in verse 1, it says that the sons of Israel journeyed and camped in the plains of Moab between beyond the Jordan, opposite Jericho. Now, Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. They had just defeated the Amorites. So Moab was in great fear because of the people, for they were numerous. 
and Moab was in dread of the sons of Israel. So Israel had this victory, and they're making their way through the wilderness, and they get to Moab, and Moab is like, we might be next. And so the king of Moab is nervous. And Moab said to the elders of Midian, Now this horde will lick all that is around us, as an ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of Moab at the time. And so he sent messengers to someone named Balaam, the son of Beor, at Pethor, which is near the river Euphrates, in the land of the sons of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, a people came out of Egypt. Behold, they cover the surface of the land, and they're living opposite me. Now, therefore, please come and curse this people for me, since they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I am able, I may be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is what? Cursed. So, Balak, the king, is nervous, and he, he calls for this, what was an internationally known prophet at the time, a man named Balaam. Say Balaam. Balaam. And he said, Balaam, will you come and curse these people? Because I know, and his reputation is that if Balaam curses someone, they're cursed. Now, you don't have a reputation as a prophet having this blessing or cursing power unless apparently it's worked in the past. It's pretty easy to find out, right? So Balaam apparently was something else. Verse 7. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the fees for divination in their hand, and they came to Balaam and repeated Balak's word. And he said to them, Spend the night here, and I will bring the word back to you, as the Lord may speak to me. And the leaders of Moab stayed with Balaam. Then God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent word to me. And he said, Behold, there's a people who came out of Egypt. They covered the surface of the land. Now come curse them for me. Perhaps I may be able to fight them and drive them out. And God said to Balaam, Do not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are what? Let's not forget that Israel, the people that he's been paid to potentially curse, are God's people. They're the descendants of Abraham. Are they foolish? Yes. Have they rebelled? Yes. But they're still God's people. Remind me of some people I know. All right? Start with me. Start with me. So God says no. Verse 13, So Balaam arose in the morning and said to Balaam's leader, Go back to your land, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. And the leaders of Moab arose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refused to come with us. Then Balak, the king, again sent leaders more numerous and more distinguished than the former, and they came to Balaam and said, Thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, let nothing, I beg you, hinder you from coming to him. And they were really putting all their eggs in this basket, right? For I will indeed honor you richly and will do whatever you say to me. Please come then and curse his people for me. So, they upped the ante. They said, we'll give you as much money as you want. Not just we'll pay you a little bit, but we'll give you as much money as you want if you come do it. Balaam replied to the servants of Balak, though Balak were to give me the house full of silver and gold, I could not do anything, either small or great, contrary to the command of the Lord my God. It should be over there, right? Well, hold on a second. Now, please stay here tonight. And I'll find out what else the Lord is teaching. So it seems like Balaam's motivation may be a little murky. He says, I couldn't do anything that God didn't want me to do. How much did you say? You were going to pay me? You know what? Why don't you stay here and I'll pray again. And maybe, you know, we'll see what happens. So God came, verse 20, to Balaam at night and said, If the men have come to call you, rise up and go with them. But only the word which I speak, you shall do it. Now, God says that he can go, but there's clearly something going on in Balaam's heart, because look what happens in the very next section. Verse 21. So Balaam arose in the morning and saddled, Balaam arose in the morning and saddled his donkey and went with the leaders of Moab. But God was angry because he was going, and an angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. Now he was riding his donkey and his two servants were with him. So Balaam's going. But something's going on in his heart so that God is angry and he sends an angel of the Lord to stand in the road. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in hand, so this isn't just an angel of the Lord like, you know, with the wings and flowing blonde hair. This angel has a sword in his hand. 
The donkey turned off from the way and went into the field, but Balaam struck, struck the donkey to turn her back into the way. So the donkey is able to see with spiritual eyes an angel standing in the way. And so the donkey, who is supposed to be walking this way, <laughs> instead goes off the road and runs into the wall. And so what does Balaam do? Peter, stand up. <laughs> Balaam smacks the donkey. Thank you, you can have a seat. So that the donkey goes back in the road. Alright? Verse 24. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path of the vineyards with a wall on the side and a wall on that side. So now he's walking down a path that has a wall on either side. And when the donkey, verse 25, saw the angel of the Lord, she pressed herself into the wall, and this time pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. So what did he do? Peter had it. He smacked the donkey again, right? And so he's getting, he's getting now physically hurt because the donkey is going against the wall. I'll lay off you. The angel of the Lord, verse 26, went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn to the right or left. So he's walking down a narrow path, perhaps uh, on the side of a mountain or something, where he couldn't just easily turn around. The angel standing there, and when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. So she gets down so that she's like, I'm not going anywhere. It's like trying to bay the cat, right? You ever try to bay the cat? They just like flying out, they just won't go in, right? Hmm. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. So Balaam was angry and struck the donkey with his stick. Okay, I have a stick here. Peter's not. I'm just here. I don't, I don't. Look what happens next. The donkey's getting busted each time this happens, and now with a stick. And the Lord, verse 28, the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? This isn't a scene from Trek. This is from the Bible where a donkey is talking because the Lord opened his mouth. Amazing. And then Balaam talks back. Verse 29, And then Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have made a mockery of me, if there had been a sword in my hand, I would have killed you by now. And then the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you've ridden all your life to this day? Have I ever been accustomed to do so to you? And he said, No. What a crazy record so far. Tell me numbers is boring. Go ahead. Go ahead. Verse 31. And then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam. And now Balaam saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed all the way to the ground. The angel of the Lord said, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out as your adversary because your way was contrary to me. But the donkey saw me and turned aside from me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, I would have surely have killed you just now and let her live. Wow. And Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know that you were standing in the way against me. Now then, if it is displeasing to you, I will turn back. But the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but you shall only speak the word which I tell you. So Balaam went along with the leaders of Balaam. What, a, what an ironic moment. This internationally known prophet he didn't even see the, the angel of the Lord in the way, but his donkey can. Talk about a reversal here, right? Who's the smart one out of these two? The donkey. A moment of humility, clearly, where this man who thought he was all that, who was getting money from kings to say this or say that blessing or cursing, he can't even see the angel. And his donkey can. And then his donkey talks to him, and he talks back to him. He gets his attention. And so now he makes his way to the king, verse 36. When Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him in the city of Moab, which is on the Arnon border at the extreme end of the border. And then Balak said to Balaam, Did I not urgently send you to call you? Why did you not come to me? Am I really unable to honor you? And so Balaam said to Balak, Behold, I have come now to you. 
So he's like, what took you so long? I offered you this money. Notice Balaam doesn't say, well, my donkey was talking to me, and there was an angel of the Lord. He just says, all right, calm down, I'm right here. Am I able to speak anything at all? The word that God puts in my mouth, that I shall speak. So he tells the king, he says, look, I'm here to do the job you hired me to do, but I'm only going to speak what God puts in my mouth. We've heard this refrain a few times now. We'll hear it again. And Balaam went with Balak, and they came to carry out Uzzah. Balak sacrificed oxen and sheep, and then sent some to Balaam and the leaders who were with him. It came about in the morning that Balak took Balaam and brought him to the high places of Baal, and he saw from there a portion of the people of Israel. What's interesting about this is the real main subject of the story is not Balaam or Balak, but it's God's people, Israel. But they're not really involved. They're just in the valley, in the wilderness. And now they bring up Balaam on top of a mountain to overlook and see the people. Israel has no idea what's about to happen. They are not participatory in this at all. They have no idea that they're about to be cursed or blessed or pronounced or that something spiritual is going on. They're just in the wilderness, walking one day at a time. So Balaam said to Balak, Build seven altars for me here, and prepare seven bulls and seven rams for me here. And Balak just did just as Balaam had spoken, and Balak and Balaam offered up a bull and a ram on each altar. So he's getting himself ready to get this word. And then Balaam said to Balak, Stand beside your burnt offering, and I will go. Perhaps the Lord will come to meet me, and whatever he shows me, I will tell you. So he went to a bare hill. Now God met Baal, and he, Baal, said to God, I have set up seven altars, and I have offered up a bull and a ram on each altar. So this is apparently what he would do to get God's attention to have him speak to him. And then look what the Lord said. Then the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return to Balak, and you shall speak thus. So he returned to him, and behold, he was standing beside his burnt offering, he and all the leaders of Moab. And he took up his discourse and said, From Aram, Balak has brought me. Moab's king from the mountains of the east. Come curse Jacob for me, and come denounce Israel. How shall I curse? whom God has not cursed. And how can I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? As I see him from the top of the rocks, and I look him for, at him from the hills, behold, the people who dwell apart and will not be reckoned amongst the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number for a part of Israel? Let me die the death of the upright and let my end be like his. So he's getting ready. He makes the sacrifices. He's preparing himself. He's probably sitting in the ball going blah, 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 or something like that. And God gives him the word. Then he goes to the king who hired him to curse Israel. And he says, he's opening his mouth, preparing to let words of cursing out upon Israel. And he goes, we can't do it. I can't curse somebody that God has blessed. Oh, I've looked at them from the top of the mountain. And they're a beautiful people. I, wish, I, I just hope that I'll be able to die like the people of Israel one day because they are blessed to be. That's all you can get out of his mouth. How do you think the king's going to respond to this? Well, look what happens in verse 11. Then Balaam said to Balaam, Why have you done this to me? I took you to curse my enemies, but behold, you've actually blessed them. What? He replied, must I not be careful to speak what the Lord puts in my mouth? Wow. Balak is not happy. He's like, look, I paid you to do this job, and you did the exact opposite of that job. But I can't help it. I can only speak what God puts in my mouth. So Balak says, let's try again. Balak says to him, please come up with me to another place where you may see them, although you will only see the extreme end of them and will not see all of them and cursed them for me there. And so he took him to the field of Zophim on top of Pisgah and built seven altars and offered a bull of ram on each altar. And he said to Balak, Stand here beside your burnt offering while I myself meet the Lord over there. They're doing the same thing again. Maybe it'll work this time. Verse 16, Then the Lord met Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said to, said to him, Return to Balak and thus he shall speak. 
He came to him, and behold, he was standing beside the burnt offering, the leaders of Moab with him, and Baal said to him, What has the Lord spoken? And so now, again, Balaam opens his mouth to let this curse out, but look what happens. And he took up his discourse and said, Arise, O Balak, and hear. Give ear to me, O son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Behold, I received the command to bless, because when he has blessed, then even I cannot revoke it. He has not observed misfortune in Jacob, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shadow of the king is amongst them. God brings them out of Egypt, and he is for them like the horns of a wild ox. There is no woman against Jacob, nor is there any divination against Israel. At the proper time it shall be said to Jacob and to Israel, Look what God has done. Behold, the people rises like a lioness. It will not lie down until it devours its prey and drinks the blood of the slain. So what comes out of his mouth? Another blessing. An awesome word. That he cannot go against what God's word has said. Verse 19, is not great? God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he not said it, that he will do it? Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? You see, God has said that Israel was going to be blessed. So you can find the prophet that's the best of the best of the best at cursing, and when he opens his mouth to curse, what's going to come out? A blessing. And then Balaam said to Balaam, Do not curse them at all, nor bless them at all. He's like, look, if you can't curse them, just keep your mouth shut. I'm paying you for this job. So Balaam said to Balak again, Did I not tell you that whatever the Lord speaks, that I must do? Isn't that amazing? Amazing. Let's go to chapter 24, verse 10. The verses that we're going to skip over are the third attempt at him blessing, or the third attempt at him cursing, and guess what comes out again? Blessing. And after Balak the king hears this in verse 10, then Balak's anger burned against Balaam, and he struck his hands together. And Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies, but behold, you have persisted in blessing them three times. He's clapping his hands. Come on, what are you doing? I told you to curse them and you did it. Bailey needs some counseling or something. Clap in his hand. Therefore, get away from me. Verse 11, flee to your place now. I said I would honor you greatly, but behold, the Lord has held, back, held you back from this honor. Oh, he's, he's sniffing him the, the money. Balaam said to Balak, Did I not tell your messengers whom you had sent me, saying, For well, Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not do anything contrary to the command of the Lord, either good or bad, of my own accord. What the Lord speaks, that I will speak. And now, behold, I am going to my people, come. And I will advise you what this people will do to your people in the days to come. He's about to go home, and then he goes, But I got one more thing I want to tell you. This one is free. And he took up a discourse and said, The oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of a man whose eyes is open, the oracle of him who hears the words of God and who knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, falling down yet having his eyes uncovered. And this is what Balaam says to Balaam. He says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob. A scepter shall rise from Israel. And will crush through the foreheads of Moab, tear down the sons of Seth. Verse 19. One from Jacob shall have dominion, and will destroy the remnant from the city. Verse 25. Then Balaam arose and departed and returned to his place, and Balak also went his way. So he tries to curse them three times, but instead comes out a blessing. And then he's getting sent away. He's not getting paid. He says, God told me one more thing to say. And then he prophesies about the coming of the Messiah, the King 
of Israel. He's, he's walking away from the king after blessing Israel these three times, and he goes, I saw one more thing. I saw someone that's coming, though I don't see him now, that he will come, though he's near, a star will rise. A king, a promised king will come who will rule God's people and will destroy his enemies. There's a prophecy about Jesus at the end of Balaam's prophecies in the book of Numbers. Come on now. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. This moment, this this dry and dusty place of the book of Numbers contains in it the words of God. And words of God which declare that His word will stand no matter what man tries to do. And I'm going to give you something a little extra. Wait till you see what He's going to do in the future when a star rises to rule His people. That's amazing. That's amazing. That's amazing. What starts as a paid gig to curse Israel ends with a prophetic word about the Messiah. What this tells me is that God is in control. Amen? God is in control. Before we look at the lessons of this, I want to tell you something that I found. There is an inscription that was found in 1967 by Dutch archaeologists. Here's a, a picture of it here on the wall. This is a, uh, an inscription that was found in the same region as the story took place. It's called the Tel Deir La. And what this is, this is not from the Bible. It's not a, a, a copy of the biblical text. It's an inscription from the time. And it's a recording of a prophecy by someone named Balaam, the son of Beal, who is called a seer of the gods. In this inscription, in the first four lines, the name Balaam son of Beor shows up three times. And the inscription describes this person named Balaam receiving a, 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 an oracle from the gods about a situation that was happening. This isn't the same story we just read, but it's a man named Balaam son of Beor that received uh, oracles from the gods. And how people would wait for him to bring his word. In the prophecy, Balaam, in this prophecy, Balaam refers to God in a very interesting way. He uses the word Shaddai, which in English is translated Almighty. So in this text, which is not a biblical text, this was found by secular archaeologists in the region of Moab, talking about a man named Balaam the son of Beor, who was a seer of the gods, he refers in his prophecy about these women that came to him for a word. He refers to God as the Almighty, Shaddai. This is one of the common titles of Yahweh in the first five books of the Bible. And this same word, Shaddai, is used twice in the book of Numbers. You want to know the two times? In Balaam's prophecy that we just read. So the two times that the word Shaddai shows up is in chapter 24, verse 4, and verse 16. We saw verse 16, 16, who sees the vision of the Almighty. So here we have this archaeological confirmation about this man named Balaam who lived at the time who people would come to get prophetic words from, and he calls God El Shaddai, just like he does here in the book of Numbers. Come on, man, the Bible is true. That's amazing. That's amazing, this outside of Scripture confirmation about the existence of this man named Balaam, the son of Beor. And when we read this, we can say, wow, generations ago in the plains of Moab, Balaam tried to curse God's people, but a blessing came out. And even people that don't believe the Bible is true confirm that that's what he did for a living back then. Mm. Amen. So what are the lessons we can learn from Numbers chapter 22 through 24. And, and give yourselves a round of applause for reading three chapters from the book of Numbers today, all right? You know? Here's some lessons. Number one, God's word is sure. What God said will happen, will happen. No matter what humans try to do. We heard five times Balaam say, I can't say a word unless God gives it to me and I can't speak against him. Because God's word is true no matter what man tries to do or say. Man will try to do things to stop God's 
our world is from progressing, but he's not going to be able to do anything. Amen? The second lesson is that, second lesson is that God is doing something even when life seems boring. Israel was in the valley, in the wilderness, but God was on the mountain doing something to protect and preserve His people. Amen? They didn't know what was going on. They are just walking through the valley. But God was working, even when it seemed like things were born and dry. And lastly, God cares for His people in spite of their behavior. Wouldn't this be a great moment to just wipe out that remaining generation? But God, because He said that the people of Israel are going to be blessed, even though they're wandering around in the wilderness, He stands for them and stops the mouth of this false prophet that wants to curse them because He loves His people in spite of their behavior. In Deuteronomy 23, years later, it says, Moses said, Nevertheless, the Lord your God was not willing to listen to Balaam, but the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you. Why? Because the Lord your God loves you. Israel didn't even know this was going on. They were in rebellion against him. But God did something for them, even when they didn't know that it was happening. Because he loved them. Isn't that just our God? Isn't that just what he does? In the times that we're in rebellion or the seasons of our life that seem dry, God is fighting for us for a greater purpose, for a greater end, even when we don't see what's going on. That's exactly what He did for His people when they were inside the church. And we don't know what God is doing on our behalf. Every moment of the day when we may seem like things aren't going the way they should be, we have no idea what God is playing and purposes really are and what they'll bring about. Because you know what? The one truth that doesn't change is that He loves us. And He's fighting on our behalf. So in Micah it says, My people... Remember now what Balak, the king of Moab, counseled, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him, so that you might know the righteous acts of the Lord. And that's what I want us to take away from today. But these are the righteous acts of God. These are these records and these stories in the book of Numbers are to tell us and to teach us about the way that our God is and what He does and that His Word stands. So when things seem like they're dry, when you read the Bible, pray. God, show me something as I read. Teach me your word. Let me hear your voice as I approach the scriptures. Please, Father, teach us something. If I need to take a break and go somewhere to get my mind right again, do that. Read Psalms, Fathers. Look at the Gospels. Talk to someone. Don't just read it in isolation. Listen to something. Read a different translation. Go back to the book of Numbers, chapter 22, 23, 24, and get a laugh that a donkey talks. When the Lord says for it to talk. And then keep reading. Keep, keep pushing through. Don't believe the devil's lies that it's not for you or that it's dry or that it's boring. God, speak to us. And then believe that the Word is working. In you. Believe that the Word is working in you in those seasons. Now, I pray that we don't have seasons that it's boring. I pray that every day when you open up the Scriptures, the words jump out and smack you upside the face and go, oh, God, you're good. I pray that's how it is. And when it's not, you do these things. You pray and you remember that God's Word is going to work. Let's close in Numbers chapter 6. Amen? Amen. If we can come to see that something like the book of Numbers is alive and filled with God's Word, wait till you get to the book of Romans. Wait till you read Ephesians. It's going to blow your mind. The love, the Word, the power, the promise, the workings of God. If our affections can go in these seasons that are dry, just wait till we get to the mountaintop. Just wait till we enter a place of abundance and lavish abundance in His Word. And so... We'll end this morning with some more powerful words from Numbers in verse 24. Chapter 6, verse 24. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
and the Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace. Let's pray. Father, we pray that this would be true, that you would bless us and keep us, that you'd make your face shine upon us and be gracious to us, that you would lift your countenance up to us and give us peace. And that when we approach your word, when we approach the scriptures, Lord, that you would teach us, that we would hear your voice as we read. Lord, if we can find you in numbers, Lord, we can find you anywhere. Thank you, Father. I pray that you would continue to increase our affection and our love for your scriptures. And Lord, that we who long to hear your voice would hear it through its angels. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.